Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to the uh, new season of From the Bottom Up. I'm here uh, live right now, and David, is um, his plane got delayed an hour and a quarter. And um, this was the one Sunday that he was going to be able to join with me in the next few weeks live. So I have... Um, I had a call the other day with Helena about some vaccination and healthcare thoughts, and I put together a 15-minute clip that we're going to play soon uh, in preparation for him coming, and then he'll uh, he'll join us on the set, and we'll continue on after that clip. But uh, yeah, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, it's good to be back, and Back on Sunday, I had tried to organize this for Saturday so I could play clips, but with so much going on in the ministry right now, this just seemed like the simplest and easiest way to just to continue to extend. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty full on with healing. And um, one of the stories that I'm going to get into with David when he gets here is this idea of pressure. And uh, I listened to Lilo talking today about the fear coming up around Iraq and Andy talking about need not be and unworthiness, and I feel like my topics today are going to be right in line with that. The other day when um, the studio team was kind of all ready to go for filming, but so much was going on, I was feeling this pressure, like how do I, how do I decide what it is to do? Do I grab David and we go do some shots? Do I go for this walk? Do I finish editing my previous shows? There was this pressure coming even around some kind of seemingly benign decisions, like who wouldn't want to talk with David? But as part of Deanna stepping in more with David and me kind of giving over, I want to say control, but it's probably not the right word, just giving over like a deeper trust and and she's been giving me suggestions to join with different people as though all of the decisions that I've been doing have just been taken off. So I was sitting there with this pressure and she called me. And at first I didn't answer because I thought, I've got to make this decision first. And I can't really give an update right now. And then after about eight minutes, I called her back and just in case there was another reason she was calling. And she just was tuned in with the Spirit and said, actually, I, don't, I feel I'm calling to let you know that I feel you shouldn't do any more recording today. Uh, there's a lot going on because she had a big picture. And all of a sudden this weight just lifted and I felt all this love and pressure release. And I was like, oh, wow. And oh, oh, now i got to go tell David that I can't do the uh, episode with him. You know, projecting the dis disappointment onto him. But he was just fine with it. So I kind of excitedly just went for a walk. And um, I was heading up to the mountains. And uh, this... It had just snowed, so there was all of this snow everywhere. So all the trails that I, a few weeks ago, had gone on, I couldn't go because I went a few steps and my feet just sunk right in. So I was sitting there in the car just praying about what, where am I going to walk? And all of a sudden I look around and there's this moose walking by me on the road. And I looked it up later and a moose is a symbol of following guidance, um, trusting other, they use the term elders in your journey, and also that uh, a stability in mind. And this joy really is the only thing that is stable. And my mind was so expansive and so joyful, knowing that the only thing I was to be doing was to be right there in that moment. And then this moose walks by. And so I thought, okay, maybe I'm to walk along the road. And so for about two kilometers, he and I just walked back and forth. But I'm going to play a little video for you showing the discovery of this and kind of wondering if I was to be alongside of him uh, because you don't normally, you don't do this. I've seen three moose in my life, even living near the Canadian Rockies, going back and forth, seeing elk and bears and, and the moose. You'd always just kind of stay away. So Susanna was beautiful when I came back because she's like, why? Why would you stay, <laughs> stay away? <laughs> like with this complete innocence as if, what's the difference between a wild animal and a domestic animal? So anyways, here's a clip of my encounter with the moose. Some of you might have seen it on Facebook, but I thought I'd just play this for some fun to start out here. Hmm. 
and they loose. Not quite sure what's happening here, but the guy just drove away and the friendly moose is coming. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay, I have to admit that was scary. Okay, well, <laughs> so that was kind of a fun encounter. I ended up walking about maybe six kilometers together, or three kilometers, and then I turned around and went back. But it was, yeah, it was just a, a beautiful reminder of the Spirit's always with me. So, <sighs> yeah. Well, the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, this past week. Um, well, some of you might have been on the online retreat. I think it was last weekend. And uh, Helena from Canada brought up the topic of vaccinations. And I don't know if I covered in this clip, but I had always grown up uh, with this idea that vaccinations were basically evil. <laughs> it's an extreme word, but since it's of the ego, let's just say it's evil. And uh, although I'd gotten a couple when I was a kid, anything future... You know, we were told not to, and I'd even gone to other countries with documents that were forged saying I'd had certain ones because I had other doctors that would sign it that were against it. So there's always this controversy of whether they're good and bad. And um, I didn't know if it was still in my mind, and then Helena brought that up. And uh, then all of a sudden I'm seeing all these articles on on Yahoo and, and even a video from this kid who's testifying about being against those who are against vaccines. So um, I'd like to just play with you this clip that, uh, first of all, the clip starts with a video of this, I think, 20-year-old who basically uh, had been not given vaccinations by his mother, who was what they call an anti-vaxxer. And then when he kind of, there's a word for it, got himself free uh, from his parents, there's a word, but he uh, decided to, you know, go get his shots. But before he did, he ended up getting measles and was so angry. So he got asked to testify in court. And so this is meant to kind of spark some thoughts in the mind. And then I've got a, a talk with David and I and uh, Helen and I. So this will be about 15 minutes. You can enjoy and we'll see you back here quickly. Thank you, Chairman Alexander, Senator Murray, and distinguished committee members for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, good morning, everyone. As uh, was stated, my name is Ethan Lindenberger, and I'm a senior at Norwalk High School. And my mother is an anti-vax advocate that believes vaccines cause autism, brain damage, and do not benefit the health and safety of society, despite the fact such opinions have been debunked numerous times by the scientific community. I went my entire life without numerous vaccines against diseases uh, such as measles, chickenpox, or even polio. However, in December 2018, I began catching up on my missed immunizations despite my mother's disapproval. Um, eventually leading to, an, to this story and being able to speak here today, and I'm very happy for that, so thank you. I was talking with Helena today mm -hmm. about 
vaccinations, because yesterday there's these two articles on the internet about vaccinations, and they actually had some kind of Congress meeting or something like that about, I don't know, basically whether they make this new rule that all the kids have to get it or not. And I mean, when I grew up just like 20 years ago, 30 years ago now, these were conversations that were so rare, my parents were like fighting against them. And mm -hmm. So I didn't end up getting vaccinated. But I saw this kid, this 20-year-old kid, saying how it's all misinformation, these anti-vaxxers, and you do need to get your vaccinations. And he was so clear about his guidance, and he was, it's just really kind of mm -hmm. wonderful. That's what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Great, it was in integrity, you know. So I, I saw this video in this article, and I sent it to Helena. We had this talk, which I've recorded, and I'll probably play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how it plays out, played out for me is like, I take it seriously what Jesus is saying in the Course, and so I want to get the healing. And so when I was, you know, when I hear false cause and effect, and I understand that from an intellectual perspective, it's like, okay, so vaccines do not create the health or protect the body from these illnesses, is like what he's saying, right? And so how it played out for me is with the kids, I was like, oh, I don't want to reinforce false cause and effect. I don't want to reinforce the illusion. So I didn't want to get the vaccines. It was um, like this decision I made for the healing of my mind. And also I thought I don't want to reinforce the illusion for them. Like, so I don't want to teach them you know, why are we going to the doctor? Why are we getting these shots? Oh, because, you know, you would explain it like, well, we're getting these to protect you from, you know, diseases or virus sickness. And it's like, I don't want to say that. I don't want to reinforce the illusion and false cause and effect. So like, I was making the decision and I didn't see that. I couldn't see that. And Yeah, it's like so humbling how I've had to really let go of my healing and <laughs> and the guidance was unexpected. It was like, actually, you're going to get them vaccinated because it's for peace of mind. Like, <laughs> and it wasn't <laughs> what I expected, you know, um, he's, yeah, he's leading me from the bottom up and I'm not in charge of that. And where I'm hooked and making a hard decision, it's like he's always trying to loosen me from that. Um, like as if I know. And yeah, and he was just, he was just like, you, it's the healing of your mind and they're included in that, you know? So um, you're not gonna be hurting them or reinforcing something for them, it's like, if I'm guiding you for the healing of your mind, they're not going to get hurt by it. It was really beautiful, her miracles around the, the vaccinations. How she's guided to just do it, because all these people just kept saying to her, you should, have your kids been vaccinated, have your, you know, all these witnesses. Mm -hmm. And when you start to get that at some point, you know, maybe it's not always just fear, but it's why mm -hmm. not go for what's easy? Mm -hmm. So she felt that as guidance, and so she did it. And it just felt, light and easy and then yeah it's interesting it's definitely going from the bottom up and i can't predict i can't wow it's like it's just super humbling because i don't know the way it's going to go um and it was for peace of mind because what was happening so much was everybody started to ask me teachers and institutions and it was that happening at every doctor's visit are they up on their shops are they updated on their shots? And, you know, I went through an entire healing with Zach, and then the twins came along, and I was delaying with them and delaying with them. I wasn't even noticing it, but I, I, there was obviously an unconscious fear there of going through that again. And I kept getting asked by everybody, are they on, up on their shots? And I'm like, no, they're a little bit behind schedule, you know. And um, so what was happening is, is I was getting – triggered by this every time and it was actually not peaceful for me and so the spirit was guiding me to something that was most peaceful mm. so getting the shots done it, it was it was for peace of mind and then it just laid the entire issue at rest for me and i was like oh okay it was just done it was just not 
it was not talked about. Mm-hmm. It wasn't an issue in my life anymore. It wasn't. It was just off the table, so mm-hmm. he could use me more fully, and I was, mm-hmm. I was, I was more old, like relaxed, and I was at mm-hmm. peace. So. I never would have expected that. Like, I never would have thought that he would guide me to get vaccines done. Mm. So, um, but yeah, that's helpful for me because it's it's about my peace of mind, and I don't know what the solution is, mm. and I don't know what's practical. I wanted to bring this whole context of Helena and the vaccinations in with you, and to see if you had any depth around this whole controversy kind of thing. So. Yeah. I think within the the dream world, there seems to be these different levels, and and there's things that seem to be practical, and and beyond the vaccinate or don't vaccinate question, you know, even if we just lifted what's right above that issue, is healthcare, and of course Jesus teaches us in the course that health is inner peace, uh, that health comes from your purpose, that health comes from being aligned with your source. Health has nothing to do with the body at all. It's just like sickness. He tells us sickness has nothing to do at all to do with the body. That's like for the human race to hear from Jesus that that sickness has absolutely positively nothing to do with the body is that's a big slam. Of course this is the guy that said Lazarus come forth and maybe he is a little more tuned in here to reality than the whole human race. But that's a lot, that sickness doesn't have to do with the body. And it what comes out in the Course where Jesus is, it has, holy. don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your perception of the body. But don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. That's, that's not, that's not even a, something that, that the Holy Spirit understands. Um, ask to have the perception of the body healed. And if the only way to have the perception of the body healed is, is to have the purpose for the body and the world healed. From, from many things that bodies are used for, and mm-hmm. believe me, they are in the ego's fragmented perception. Mm-hmm. Bodies are used for many different things. Mm-hmm. Millions, billions of different things. And then the Holy Spirit only sees it as a communication device for what? To go beyond the body. To expand your perception, mm-hmm. to go beyond the body, go back mm-hmm. to your divine mind, you know, to, to the sense that everything is mine. So that's huge. That just the very definition, if you take it up to health care, to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, and then you go, okay, it's a health care issue. For example, let's use, since it's from the bottom up, let's not get too, too ethereal and too abstract, let's just jump into health care. That, that's a, a great topic, especially when you're talking about vaccinations. That's healthcare. That's under the topic of healthcare, in the world at least. So in healthcare, you know, there are those that, that say, you know, with all the resources we have in this world, why don't we do more like they have in Europe? Like they have, you know, when you're with a country, you know, you have these resources and they take the taxes and they say, healthcare, health of human beings is important. Let's use our taxes and give healthcare and pharmacy and pay for things and existing conditions and and deformed bodies and all kinds of all that let's just use that because that's just a good use of money um, that's just a relative value but it's saying that's that's what we'd like to do and so you can have people living in these countries going yeah the health care is pretty good I mean you we pay it in taxes but but we love it because it's it's covered. We don't have to <laughs> have this big mm-hmm. panic like can I Canada, mm-hmm. Holland, Belgium, you know, we go over Scandinavia, you know, they like this. And then another perception of healthcare is, you know, it's like you know, it's people have to fend for themselves, you know. If they get sick, eh, if they die, eh, you know, it's like build wealth, capitalism go to the moon, <laughs> I mean, there's just a few other values, let's do this, let's go to the moon, let's, let's do this, let's do this, and then it's like, eh, it's, you know, it's not so important. Then someone comes along and says, you know, well, maybe we should have health care for everyone, and oh. We're not a socialist. Oh, country. bloody murder, it's a socialist, and this is the very thing over here that seems 
quite uh -huh. wise and reasonable, is seen as oh, that socialism. It runs against the core of capitalism and runs against the core of all these things. There's so many perceptions in the world of healthcare, but what's the one commonality in those perceptions? That they all involve Fine. the body. And then the way shower, the way, the truth, the life comes along. The one who actually is aware, who's transcended all of those egoic beliefs and says health is inner peace mm -hmm. and says health is not of the body, health is of the mind. It is with your thoughts alone that we must work. I mean, you need a purification here, you need to, to release egoic beliefs and thoughts. Here comes the way, the truth, and life with all of the answers, including for health care. You know, he's not shying away from any topic from the bottom up. He is here to correct things from the bottom up. And, and you can see how different that is. So really it's a question of trust, it's a question of prayer, it's a question of are you willing to take responsibility for your state of mind, which includes your experience with everything in the world, including the body. So if you come to a place of non-judgment, then you'll have inner peace, you'll have harmony, you'll have happiness, peace, joy. It all comes from that clarity, from forgiveness, from true forgiveness. And, and there's the way shower giving it. So mm. that's what we do from the bottom up as we, you address things. That's what mm. Helena was talking about initially, was she was bringing up the question like, I, I'm practicing guidance. And if you start getting symbols around here and there, you, sh you know, you should do this, you should do, those can be signs and symbols. Uh, even on the God Unfriended Me show. God Friended Me. Or God Friended Me. <laughs> That was one, 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 episode. Point, one episode where unfriended. But God friended me and then there's all these things around what, what should I do with my life, what about my career, what about my relationships that are all kind of included in that guidance. And, and I like to watch the symbols that are around, you know, especially about the two characters that are collaborating and they have all these people around him like, you guys be amazing together and have you ever thought of being oh together and we're not there yet. Bump, 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 bump. it comes around and around and around. <laughs> the right time, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's the right timing. So, you know, that's where the discernment comes in and, and that is practical to start to ask with these things, you know, what, what is my guidance? Because it's, that's where you start to connect with true cause and effect. You start to bring things back to the mind and and yet you still seem to take actions, mm -hmm. uh, but they're guided actions. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not just um, haphazard, hit or miss kind of things. Very different. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, hey everybody. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. <laughs> I'm back, David's made it. He's virtually <laughs> appeared. <laughs> From San Diego, I guess. Yeah, yeah. How, how was the trip? Oh, it's great. From palm trees to winter wonderland, <laughs> you know, with the lots of delays and, and so forth, mechanical difficulties. But yeah, it's, it made it. Hmm. Any, anything highlights stand out from the trip? Because you did a day gathering, right? And yeah, yeah. Our friend uh, Rita came and brought her, her group uh, down from Huntington Beach out. LA and and then there was uh, some friends of mine from Georgia, um, John and Camille, who I they were some 1990s no friends. Way. They showed up, so I did a bit in the afternoon of I I, I was mm -hmm. comparing my life to the Star Trek. All the different, I said the original was in the 1980s, then the next generation was in the 1990s, then in the 2000 Deep Space Nine and. <laughs> So I don't even know what I'm into now, but I call them the millennials. We talked a lot about the millennials and mm. reaching the younger people who are coming faster into an awareness that, you know, that the world holds nothing. I said, they're living less than 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. Mm. So, yeah, we had a, yeah, it was very lively. Here the Voyager time. episode. Yeah. <laughs> so I did mention times then, some of these people had never heard of me, so that, talked about the matrix redux and one woman was like, so what have I got to do to 
to see this Matrix composite movie, and I said, I don't know, it might, might be on Movie Watcher's Guide with some commentary, I'm not sure. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Cool. Well, thanks for slipping in here. Mm -hmm. I, the thing that um, we were just talking about in the same setup here was about healthcare, and you were mentioning Jesus, who you know raised Lazarus from the dead, and and um, I thought I'd like to continue on that episode at one point, and so I went into you the other morning mm -hmm. and mentioned that, and you told me about an article that you had just read about the Finnish government. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if I'm going to take it in the way that you meant to, but that's what I wanted to start off with because mm -hmm. you said, uh, well, maybe you could share about this article with everybody first. So. Yeah, it was beautiful. The, the entire Finnish government resigned because they had run on a platform of different um, reformations. One of them was mainly the healthcare system in Finland is to reform it and to make it more cost effective and uh, improve the health care for the, everybody in the country, which is aging. There's over 20% uh, of the people in Finland that are over 65 years old. So, but they resigned uh, close to the next election uh, because they didn't accomplish their goal. They didn't accomplish what they ran on the platform. They didn't significantly reform or improve the healthcare system, and so they said, "Well, we didn't do it, but uh, other people can can come in, and you know, we we shouldn't be here if we didn't do what we said we could do." So the whole government res resigned. But to me, it was uh, he was talking more about political accountability, um, which is is kind of a, a, a form of integrity, you know, which uh, integrity is beautiful whatever you get a symbol of it, and ultimately then the integrity is in the mind. Everything you think and say and do and feel uh, is all in alignment is what really integrity or true honesty is. Well, this is the part I want to talk about because after I left your room when you mentioned that, since I never think whatever you're saying to me is like just oh, casual or something, like what is it mm -hmm. for me? and. I don't know if this is true, this is why I wanted to ask you. <laughs> was, I took it as like, okay, that's, <laughs> it's gonna be. <clears throat> I took it as the, I can't even voice it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so scared. Uh, spit it out, man. <laughs> 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 is the four months where, I w where you guys were traveling and I was working with the millennials and we had overseers and ninjas and it was like, for me, it was a high communication function, teaching mm -hmm. them how to communicate. And ultimately, I guess it's all a forgiveness lesson, but I really believed I had the purpose to kind of show them what it's like to live with elders and maybe as much as the elders would be around them, mm -hmm. have this love kind of rub off and see how decisions get made. And so I poured my heart into this. But then now with this new phase coming in with you and Deanna, um, and wherever there was like this expansion and then the expansion, so to speak, things got dropped or lost or there's like, oh yeah, forget about it, it's just forgiveness and the core, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like that's the focus. There's this feeling like, okay, whatever my mission was, which is I'm not fully even clear on it, failed. And so when you say that, yeah, were you saying that in a way? <laughs> asking you. I know you're not going to say I was wrong, but what if you were meaning that to me? Can we go into that topic a little bit more? Because what happened after I left you was I just assumed that was true and thought, okay, well, what was my mission? And let's just take full responsibility. And I had this experience where I was like, you know, like in Tron, where he's at the very end and he mm -hmm. puts his hands yeah. down and the whole world comes back into his mind. I was like, okay, no more thoughts of people didn't help me or join me or I don't know if I took the ministry on. It's all my mind. Okay, I, yeah, I did do it. And then it was just like, whoom, like this feeling. And it felt, it felt really good, actually. But, but I can't help but separate that from, from the I did things right 
or wrong. And so I, I wanted to go into that deeper. How do you really, what did you mean? How do I take it back? So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of. Well, I think it's, it all starts that here we are in the show, the bottom up, and it all starts with starting off with the seemingly the form of things. That's the presenting problem, so to speak, or the presenting situation. And then, you know, coming back deeper and deeper into an integrity. And I think ultimately it runs so, so deep because it's not. It's not just about behavioral integrity, integrity, which is the way many people in the world see it. Um, it goes much, much deeper into the mind. But also, it, the whole idea of prayer is so deep because, you know, it's the prayer is actually described by Jesus in the Song of Prayer as like a ladder, and you go up the rungs higher and higher and higher until you reach the top top of the ladder, which is the highest prayer that there can ever be, is, Father, what is your will for me? To know that your will and God's will are, are one, are in harmony, for happiness is, is the return to heaven. And then the steps along the way are all always steps in, I think it's a purification that's going on in the mind. You know, like, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. It's always something like that in a deeper realm. So it's, it's not so much in terms of um, assignments or successes or failures. It, it does come into like it's all going down, deeper down the rabbit hole. It's all going down deeper into the purification. And I feel like, you know, that we were talking about with the Finnish government is, is an example, but it was just a beautiful example to me of uh, of of an admission that, oh, we ran with a goal, we didn't accomplish the goal, so we'll step aside and, and you know, let whoever is planning to come in next or whoever is elected next have their, their shot at it. Mm. So uh, I feel like it's, it's always a progression. I mean, everything's always going towards the healing, and so it's not like there are true successes or failures. Jesus even says in the Course, you can't judge your advances from your retreats mm -hmm. because everything's backwards and upside down in this world. So it's not like you can use the same standards of the world to, to kind of gauge mm. spiritual development. Mm. It's more the prayer of the heart is to let everything go and, and be shown, let it all be revealed. Mm. And that's always happening. So, I think that's the, the main context of it. It's funny because um, just when you mentioned the different Star Trek crews you've mm -hmm. worked with, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I was, was, I'm saying was, I was part of the uh, <laughs> Deep Space Nine in 2000 yeah. to... Yeah. But, it, but when you were saying that now it's the Millennials, I feel like I'm not in that crew or something. <laughs> yeah. I want to be, but I'm like, oh my God, am I just going to be passed to the wayside or something like that? And, you know, normally I would, I would think the other way, like I'm more advanced, but now I'm having these thoughts of like, oh my God, what if I'm going to be <laughs> left well, behind? <laughs> your generation was, it was like the the 2000s, when I look back, is just having the monastery come in and then that house, uh, Bandana Ranch, and and uh, the, oh, the beginning of the big, huge, huge projects like uh, MMT, Mystical Mind Training, the, the massive collaborations, collaborations in so many different projects, whether it's fixing up the monastery, completely rehabbing from inside out uh, masterpiece, um, this bandana ranch house coming in basically is a little like incubator for uh, mystical mind training and specific ones coming in there. And then I think after MMT, uh, Helena Hunison was in there and Al and different ones and it, it kind of was a music collaborations. So uh, I was kind of uh, sharing these steps, even the first, I would say the 80s, where I was out in the woods in the Hermitage in uh, Kentucky, on Lake Arrowhead, um, near Corinth, Kentucky, and having mystical experiences. It, that was the 80s, were like three revelatory 
experiences. So it's like starts with blazing light and then the 90s was lots and lots of travel around the United States and and Canada and uh, uh, since John and Camille were there I said oh you're from that that era and uh, going down to uh, you know to Georgia and uh, with Catherine and Jim and one doing a gathering quite a few in airplane hangar with one time where people even during one-on-ones during the break were up in the air being flown around in, in planes and just giving people little flavors of how rich and full it was with all those travels and all those gatherings and everything and uh, including yeah that's how I met you on those trips uh, up there to Edmonton during all that phase of travel and gathering and then the 2000s to me were um, it was like so many collaborations like we working together with a synergy like we had never done before to put together these amazing tools that you know to this day um, people are using everything from MMT to the online movie watchers guide to enlightenment uh, just the the way that the the properties and the structures were used as these incubators for people to come and have a safe place to be to basically go through their darkness and let it all up learn to pray learn to communicate learn through all kinds of relationships and undoing old egoic patterns to to work together in a synergistic way for the good of the whole very expansive like hugely expansive and then that's the forerunner I, th I think um, it was like more with the Millennials it wasn't so much their age but it was more like it's like they've they've seen the the nothingness of the world it, I, I was saying they were like more like in their teens and 20s living the lesson 128 I, the world I see holds nothing that I want where they they, they get to the end of the rope <laughs> uh, faster and then it's not like that is spiritual enlightenment or anything that's just the, a faster disillusionment with the world they're still wandering looking around trying things out trying relationships out not fitting into the world not fitting into school not fitting into anything of, of the world and uh, sometimes even going through drug addictions and all kinds of things but it's just like going through things that the other generation sometimes took years or decades to move through and they're like what where do we go and so um, you're part of the I, I did mention Spiri and Spiri TV and and uh, one of our hosts uh, Gabrielle who was our transportation our driver she said I was so touched when you mentioned the Millennials because it just touched me that, that that they're in your mind that you're praying and thinking how do we reach these mm -hmm. they have different languaging they have different symbols that they've they're familiar with they have a different way of of interacting with the world than previous generations and she was so touched she said oh my god I have a nephew and and he's 21 right now and he's going through that you know it, it really feels like we're here and, and now it's almost like we're just shifting gears to uh, to reach to extend now in, a, in a, a, another way that that is going to be very pertinent and very practical I think also we've talked about how you know Jesus would preface his talks with uh, for those that have the ears to hear let them hear and the Millennials in many cases in their own way have the ears to hear and and yet it's it has to come in a way that really they can understand it that it's relevant that it grabs their attention so so that was my thing and I don't know that I, I don't really see that anybody's like um, being left behind or anything like that I do feel like it's it's just we're all in a place of prayer and letting Jesus direct and lead the way and and saying how can we be most mm -hmm. helpful in that and mm -hmm. 
that's all we're doing is, mm -hmm. is uh, staying in that prayerful place of show the way, show us the way. Mm. Yeah. Just the fact that I like let's go past all the fear and everything and see it in terms of being in or out. Does that reflect like more accurately the truth, shall I say, about getting in touch with the abandonment? Is that like a deeper layer than just projection and all that stuff? Yeah, I do feel like any type of, of, of abandonment feelings or uh, being out of like of some of the main flow or something or being rejected or anything in those those really do go back to the that core ego belief and core ego emotions mm -hmm. uh, which which most often are are often projected to God as if uh, like that um, that famous song. Um, until the one who left us here returns for us at last. That come on people now, smile on your brother song. Uh, even that, until the one who left us here returns for us at last. What's that? Projecting on God like, well, God left us here and eventually God will come back for us. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's still, there's all kinds of projections onto God and then it's very typically projected onto people or groups, or communities, or situations, you know, like that, where there's a feeling of, uh, like, abandonment, or missing the boat, or something like that, which is, yeah, it does go all the way back to God, to that feeling like something very wrong seemed to occur, or there was an experience of an ontological guilt of wrongness, mm -hmm. and then people oftentimes feel uncomfortable, with the world, or uncomfortable in, in the skin, or uncomfortable in relationships, or or very afraid of shifting relationships, like I, I could miss the boat, or I could get left out, or something like that. And yeah, that all goes back to that one ontological belief and feeling of, of separateness. Because I was praying this morning, I was a little bit afraid of if you came back, because I would talk about this, but like I have this experience, like I, when I first started even building Moodle, mm -hmm. I was really teaching some of the audios and pulling out from what you said, this idea that you can just kind of go home to God through following guidance and mm -hmm. you would just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, and then one day, years later, you said, you know, it's not like that, it's, it's messy, like there's a, there's a messiness. And I just took that as like, whoa, I've got to really, maybe I'm skipping something by just thinking that way. And then now more the experience is like, yeah, which is the scary part is like one, one of the, sh yeah, one of the shows, a few shows back months ago, mm -hmm. you said, uh, yeah, you don't know, you know, things could be under, there could even be a suicide thoughts or something. And I didn't know if you were referring to me or somebody in the audience at the time, but that's always stuck with me. And then lately, like um, yesterday I had, uh, for the first time since, I had stepped out. I actually finished everything on my list, all my to-dos. Like I've been mm -hmm. slowly working at it, like mm -hmm. taxes and even editing and my intro. I just got the intro ready. Yeah, yeah. Everything was just, I'm like, oh my God, I have, I don't have anything else. Obviously I could find something. Your plate was relatively clean. It was clean. <laughs> and so then I went for a walk and came back. And on the way back, I just, I just started bursting into tears. like. And I would hear that thought again, like, I don't want to be here. And, and I'm like, what is that? Because I really looked at it and I could, if I'd hear it before, I would think, okay, the ministry, but mm -hmm. I don't really feel that's what it is. And then it's like, oh my God, is that the, is that the like, a suicide thought? Doesn't want to be here. Is that what you would mean? And it just feels like when you're not covering it over with any kind of next thing or doing or something and it's there, but then it's, it feels so big or something and then there's just the sadness that but it just like it closes up so quickly and I don't and then what happens is, is I if it closes up and then I think certain people are wrong or situations and then yeah so I don't so yeah I don't know what to do with that like do you because do I was talking with Deanna last night and 
she said, oh yeah, well there must be some like attraction to things of the world, which is on Andy's show and the things that you think you want hold you back as much mm -hmm. as the things you don't. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I can see thoughts in the mind that I'm not really running for, but can it, and she said, oh, you can't even look at those until you face the wrongness. So I'm like, okay, you got to face the wrongness. Then you see attraction, then... It, so, I'm just, mm -hmm. so I thought I'd bring this up. And, yeah, it's like the path of the Course is through the darkness to the light. That's why it can seem messy. I mean, it, it can be like a, a bursting experience, kind of like the Eckhart Tolle, you know, Park Bench experience, although there, he would probably tell you, well, there was a lot of, of darkness that moving through the darkness that came even before the park yeah. bench experience. So don't think it's just like, poof, you know, a park bench awakening and then, you know, it can be that easy. For most it's it's not. And even for Eckhart, I'm sure there were stages and things that he moved through. And then it was very disorienting after the park bench experience, like like not relating to the world and needing to reorient and reintegrate just to be able to seem to function after that experience it was so massive. But for most, it's a slowly evolving curriculum and and there, you're describing too that there are, there's some darkness and, and dark emotions with it and then there's the, the attractions that are with it too and they, they seem to be very different in the world except they're really the same. It's like looking at a diamond from different angles. Oh, wow. It just glitters um, and looks like attractions and then when you flip it around it, it's really the bottom side is very dark and wow. so forth. It's the same error. It's the same... So it's not that attractions you know, are on top of them. They're literally... They are the, same. the same. It's, like the, it's absolutely wow. identical. So which is why the teachings of the Course, even pain and pleasure, wow. it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. Uh, you know, the, you can't have one without the other, you know, it, these are very deep teachings. And even um, the self-concept, which the face of innocence is more, you know, on the surface and there can be some, you know, times when the, it says the face is wet with tears at the injustices of the world and, and so forth. And it can have some attractions and pleasurable aspects. And then underneath that is again what we're talking about, the what Jesus says that the dark, the shadow uh, aspect of the self-concept that's draped with sin, he says, you know, very, very dark. But, you know, starting to come to see that it's all the same. So, is, so when I'm feeling that emotion, that sadness, that's not the darkness? Like if that's the same as the attraction, that's not the darkness? Still underneath that? There's well, it's, it's, it's part of it. I mean, the sadness is, is mm -hmm. an, an experience. Sadness, deep sadness, grief, depression, you know, mm -hmm. all the seeming aspects of that, that's the darkness. And then also the, the seeking after something that will, in the world, that will placate or distract or solve or whatever. You know, it's all part mm -hmm. of one package that's just kind of flipped, get, kind of gets flipped around and around. And that's why it's, it seems to take so long. If, if guilt wasn't attractive, if the ego didn't make guilt attractive, then it would be a pretty quick journey mm. to God. <laughs> but because it would just be like uh, putting your hand on a stove, I say, you know, and you yeah, burn yeah. yourself and it's like, that's enough of that, I will never go there again. But there's, guilt is flipped around in, by the ego into attractive things. And that's why it seems to take quite an unwinding and, with, and a withdrawal and an and a exposure because of, of that underneath. So where does the wrongness fit in? Is that even a more surface than these attractions and sadness kind of a thing? I think it, when it's on the surface, it's tied into certain behaviors, regrets, coulda, woulda, shoulda's. It's tied into the, to more the body and the personality. As you go way down into the mind, you, it's an ontological wrongness, like a deep feeling of something went terribly, terribly wrong. It's, it's the, the belief in separation from God and, you know, the obstacles to peace, you get it down to the fear of God, you know. Mm -hmm. Why would God be fearful unless there was a sense of wrongness, like actual wrongness, like actually trying to usurp mm -hmm. God, actually believing you pulled off the separation, you know, 
that's getting down to real, real deep, dark feelings that are very covered over in awareness because the mind can't handle that, you know, intensity or the Jack Nicholson line underneath it. You can't handle the truth. And, and Jesus is like, well, that's actually the case, but you can't handle the air either. <laughs> you're, you're distracting on the surface because the separation is, mm -hmm. this ontological wrongness is too dark, too sad to handle, pushed out of awareness, mm -hmm. and underneath it the blazing light of God and truth is, of course, pushed, is underneath that, so it's all pushed out of awareness. Part of the amnesia of mm -hmm. forgetting God and love and heaven. So in these conversations I'm having, like with, like, for example, one of the people in our community, it's going on tour soon, and I'm joining with him about, about it. And rather than just trying to figure it out, it's like just taking each moment very slowly and feeling, you know, like almost from zero, is it guided? What's guided? Like, where's the path? Where's it coming from, really, mm -hmm. in a deep yeah, level? Yeah. And, and in doing that, I'm, I'm present. I'm, I'm, it's a direction. I feel very yeah. good with that. And, and then I'll have these conversations with another member of the community and, and the way she'll say things to me, it's like, you know, if I stay in full alignment with nothing, like this moment and just what now, what now, it feels good. But as soon as I interpret it as something was wrong and now we're fixing it here or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, it just feels terrible. I feel terrible. And I don't know if it's actually what's being spoken, it's my interpretation. And metaphysically, mm -hmm. there's no difference. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know how to approach it because do I like say nothing and then, oh, I'm going to be taking my next direction from that place that something's wrong? Or is it like I need to speak to it and say, I cannot operate if there's any feeling of like something was, was wrong. But then when I do that, I almost feel like I'm making the error more real. And I really want to like get under this. And, and I feel like this is a gift being given to me to get under this wrongness, but I, I don't, I literally don't know. Do I speak to it? Do I not? Do I say nothing? I'm starting to get glimpses. Like when I say nothing, I just sit with it, something softens, and then she'll even ask me a question what I think about the very mm -hmm. same thing that I'll then get to mm -hmm. express, but it's not, ah, it's not mm -hmm. like coming from a harshness. And yeah. So then, because I don't want to stay in that realm, and I have to get through this realm to get to these deep, deeper things. So yeah, I do. yeah, this is a deep thing for me, so yeah. I don't know. I think it's just again undoing the belief in linear time because it's not like, it, you know, this timeline of past, present, and future and, and this thing that some event or circumstance or, or something happened in the past that was wrong. It's more that, you know, it's like that Elisa Moore song, you know, only an instant does this world endure. You know, what a beautiful idea, because what it does is it takes linear time and it starts to squeeze linear time down. If you could take the big timeline, you start to squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, and you really squeeze it all the way, you come back to the unholy instant, which is the wrong mind, and the holy instant, which is the right mind. And this moment is the choice. It's not about coulda, woulda, shoulda, as something could have been different in form, or something could have been changed, or something could have been better. That's where the guilt comes in. Did I do something wrong? Could I have done something better? You know, wanting approval, wanting, wanting to make it right, you know. And, and this is how linear time is perpetuated. He goes saying, yeah, something went terribly wrong in the past. Don't even doubt that, you know, you're guilty and it was terrible and it's saying the present moment is not, you can't really change it and therefore it, you're doomed to hell because of what happened, you know, and, it, and that's where this hellfire idea came into a lot of different religions, you know, you'll burn in hell, you'll, you'll pay, you don't think you can separate from God and not have a consequence. And so it's always very dark. It's projected into a, a, a 
dismal future, a, a very dark, dark future. That's why a lot of the, even the movies about the future, even some of our classics, Days of Future Past, you know, this destruction, you know, where the, you know, the, the humans and the, the, all the mutants are, it's just dark, 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 and then we've got to go back in time to, to change it or correct it. The Course is not saying you, we go back in time really to correct it, it's saying this instant, if you have a split mind, you, you have to learn to choose correctly, you have to choose the correction, choose the miracle, choose the healing. Right now, now is your point of power, now is where it's all right there. Through dissociation, the mind's trying to maintain two uh, irreconcilable thought systems. One of fear, which is the darkness, the unholy instant, the past. One of, of love, which is the forgiveness, the atonement, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. So, you know, when we have these conversations, it is apparent more and more that it is feeling, you're like feeling the more the intensity when these two thought systems are brought back together when it's actually how the healing occurs. It's ending the dissociation. When you bring darkness and light together, only one remains. Mm -hmm. Only one is real. But by trying to keep them apart, how do you do that? Through a timeline. Could this event have been different? Could I have done any better? You know, you see how it's always, yeah. the ego's trying to always push it off to the timeline and could have, would have, should have. If only, I mean, all the psychotherapy that people do for years and years, going to therapists, rehashing their childhood, re rehashing their teen years and, and uh, their relationships, uh, going over and over those things on the timeline, or all those memories, but that's still not going to bring about the solution. Even the movie that the, one of your all-time great collapsed movies was the, was the Star Trek Time's End. And the main character, you know, is raging because he believes that uh, Captain Picard was taken by the Borg and had something to do with the death of his wife on the timeline. And he's furious about it. But then he has to go on this whole adventure with, you know, to, to humbly start to realize that, you know, it's your choice. It's your choice right now. It's not something of the past, you know, that's a, such a fantastic little episode of 50 minutes or whatever on completely undoing the belief in linear time and taking full responsibility for the choice that you had. And, and at the end, here's our main character with tears coming down his face going, it's not linear. <laughs> you know, it's like, boom! He pops, you uh -huh. know, he pops. It's intense, wow. but he pops. Yeah. Because the actual, when you pop, like just, it's just seeing clarity or whatever, it's nothing. It feels very neutral. Yeah. But until then, it's like, that's a drama or something. Yeah. It's oh, very, yeah. Linear time is very dramatic. It's lots of drama. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> sometimes you can go <laughs> straight on him. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that, oh, there are people, maybe we can wave for a second. Yeah, we get to see all of our, wow, our smiling faces. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It's heavy. Yeah. Oh, Raphael, Sevi, Troy, Kelly, Mary, Julie, yep. There's Jeff still on top of the world. <laughs> <Down there. laughs> Stephen, it's yeah, it's very very precious. This yeah, when you first did that Times End movie, we were like everyone was like, oh my gosh, because it was so compressed the whole thing of the core of the healing, you know, of getting you know beyond the dualism of the of the world because he was so steeped in dualism. He's like, baseball! <laughs> They're like, yeah, competition. competition. Aggressive. Competition. 
aggressive, adversarial, adversarial, and he's like saying, no, it's, you don't know what's going to happen when the pitcher pitches the ball and the batter hits it. You don't know what's going to happen, and you know, you know, they're basically saying, you, re you really think your ignorance is, is, is valuable or something, mm -hmm. you know. The, the hypotheticals that are to the sleeping mind that are really, oh, you don't know what's going to happen on that first date. You don't know what's going to happen when the, the pitcher pitches to the batter. You know, it's like it's part of an ignorance when actually what takes you out of it is choice, that you, seeing you have a choice for healing. Always, in every instant, you have a choice for healing. And then slowly becoming aware that, that that's actually the only option that, that is reasonable. The wrong mind is not a reasonable choice. The a ancient, you know, instant of, of hatred, you know, the unholy instant is not an actual reasonable choice. You know, it, it's the correction, the, the love, the light is reasonable. Mm. And we are worthy of that. And, and that's part mm. of the whole Awakening is starting to see we're worthy of, of that love. I had, uh, you weren't here, but I, did you see that moose clip? No, I, I saw something on Facebook, uh, just a little bit, maybe like a photo. Of, just a photo, uh, okay. Of the moose. Well, I, you missed it, but I shared with everybody that uh, you and I kind of were just praying about this last week if we would do pre-records or mm -hmm. filming. and. And then just with the studio team being so busy, one day I was just praying whether to do it or not, and I was feeling all this pressure, and then Deanna called me and said uh, she really feels there's too much going on. And, but I wasn't, didn't feel she was saying there's too much going on. It was like she was answering a prayer that you don't, don't mm -hmm. do it today. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this lightness lifted off and I could go do this walk, which is where the moose thing came in. And he actually walked up, you didn't see the video, but he walked right up to me on the road and <laughs> like a horse put his hand in my... <laughs> And I was like, hey, buddy, <laughs> and then walked away. <laughs> okay, that's a little <laughs> wild moose, you know. Oh, yeah, just, right. And not a horse. <laughs> I guess it feels there's a difference. But it showed me, I always thought if I was just in India or something and lions were roaming around like that guy, I'd just sit there calmly while the lions, mm. but here was a female moose and I was, <laughs> I could feel like right. <laughs> But the point being that to come to you after she called and kind of freed me from that and say, because I would come to you and say, do you want to do it? Are you feeling? And every time I'd feel like you're so open, not even just open, just like, yeah, we could go and da 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 da. And just like, and so when I came and was about to say, we're not going to do it, I was like, this, oh, I can't, how can I say this to David, you know? And you're like, oh, that's fine, tomorrow morning. And then I'm like, well, it might be better. <laughs> be <laughs> and there's some kind of like, devastation that you'd be open and I say that but it was it, the walk was so amazing with the moose and it's about trusting elders and joy something about joy and mm -hmm. stability and everything and then I was meditating that later that night and I heard no it's just how much you love me actually whenever mm -hmm. you're so open for this it's not mm -hmm. about something has to happen and then I'm stopping it it's, mm -hmm. you're just you're loving me and I'm like oh my god God, if I could just see everything in that kind of a realm instead of we're doing good or bad, you know, yeah. or something. Yeah, there's no, we're not trying to make something happen, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful too that you, you had that encounter with that big moose because I just read a newspaper article or a, a news article you probably saw too where they, it was up at one of the, the state or the federal parks, I don't know if it's Yellowstone or one of the big ones, um, and there was a giant moose loose that they said was uh, intimidating, terrorizing um, park visitors. And uh, so your story is a whole different take on you know your encounter with this moose because they actually flew four Canadian wolves and an airdropped them uh, into the park to get give, give a predator to, <laughs> to get the moose. <laughs> right? I'm like. Wow, this is really, it was, I just saw that, I thought, airdropping Canadian moose 
moose. Wolves, yeah. Wol and or wolves to, to get the big intimidating moose, and then you're out on the road <laughs> having a, a holy encounter with a, with a moose. <laughs> <laughs> well, what had happened, I told everybody, I had parked on the side of the road because there was nowhere to walk. There was mm -hmm. so much snow, and I said, well, where am I going to walk? And then this moose just walks by on the mm -hmm. road, and I thought, well, I'll walk with the moose. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's good. That's letting go of all thoughts of danger in the world. Yeah, and <clears throat> yeah, like that movie where the like you mentioned the young mystic is goes into the village with the lion, and right. you know, he's just meditating. And yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. Wow. Okay, current. Well, I, I think we're probably wrapping it up here. I was just, yeah, maybe the last question I have is like before these shows start, I just, and it was interesting today because were you going to come on or not? Was it going to play this thing? And all of this fear, it was just fear and pretty much most of the morning again. And, and I attribute that to you. I'm about to say things that I'm, terrified or let go of some concept or something but then when it was like okay you're not coming it just relaxed and then it, is it true that the yeah is it true that the fear is just about this exposure and like getting closer into the light and these shows are good for that or because when the fear's up you're just thinking well this must be the wrong direction you know but no it's it's never helpful to interpret that that the fear is a wrong direction in the sense that it's the, the fear is the fear of love, the fear of the ego's fear of, of annihilation, the ego's fear of being lost. Like, it's like, I don't want to keep exposing to the light because in the end, I won't be around uh, to expose anymore. It's a, it's a fear of loss of self, loss of identity. And that's, of course, that's the, what the whole world is about, you know, all mm. the, the sleeping mind seemingly projected out as all these six, seven billion personalities, you know, are, it's just the fear of losing something that now is real mm. and that actually exists. But actually the world and the projections, the body, the cosmos, they don't actually exist because God didn't create them. So. Mm. You know, the ego is hoping and hoping that it will have a perpetual existence, even though it has none. And it's hoping that God will just crack, almost like a, a child who throws a temper tantrum mm -hmm. and wants candy or ice cream or something. And then uh, it's feeling like, I'm going to get mom, you know, I'm going to get her to give me what I want in the grocery store. I'll throw up the biggest temper tantrum and hissy fit right in front of all those other customers in public so I can get that candy or that ice cream cone. And the ego is, a, you know, it throws its temper tantrums and everything. It wants to exist. It wants God to grant reality to time and space. And God wouldn't be God if God granted reality to time and space because God is spirit. God is eternal love. And, and God everything that God creates is, is spirit and eternal. Mm. So it's this, this uh, friction of, mm. it's basically fear of loss mm. of identity. Mm. Something, it, the ego believes something real will be taken away. There will be a sacrifice that has to be paid to go back to mm. heaven and oneness. And it's not the truth. That the ego made up sacrifice as well. How can, how can you have to give up the unreal to know the real? And call that a sacrifice, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. it's, it's, it's not, not mm. realistic. But that's it, that's always the core thing, that's mm -hmm. what the fear is. I even got asked that when I was out at the gathering in San Diego, where one woman in the front row, she just said, can you, I wrote it down in my notes, we are afraid of love, but can I ask about that? I don't, I don't, how, I don't know that I'm afraid of love, and I explained, well, while you're sleeping and dreaming and identify with the ego, that's where the fear of love comes in. Love, love isn't fearful, you know, mm -hmm. from what it is. It's the ego that's afraid of the love because of the loss, the belief in, in loss. Mm -hmm. And that comes from the, the belief in separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Thank you, dear. Beautiful. Beautiful. Sweeties. Sweeties. <laughs> oh, Helen is there. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Beautiful. Joni, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> All the hearts. Thumbs up. Prayers. Love, 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 love. Thank you everybody for joining another episode of From the Bottom Up. I'm back on Sundays now, so we'll see you every Sunday. Love you. Love you. <laughs>